obviously we're going to talk about motivation. We will talk about re reward and reinforcement. I think that's really important if you have uh, questions or concerns about the motivation of your of your child. So we want to be able to unpack that so you understand um, how uh, reward uh, works, how uh, motivation uh, works. And we'll talk about some sort of issues too. Just to want to give you an introduction to some factors that may actually affect motivation or the value of reward. So it's something a typically developing child might think is just the greatest thing ever. A student with ADHD and, and perhaps other conditions may see the world in a different way. So we want to we want to honor that and uh, understand uh, the importance of focusing on how uh, motivation works for the individual. It's there's nothing generic about it, but there's there's just some things that affect you know child and adolescent development. How old is your child? What kind of physical and mental health conditions do they have, including ADHD? The thing we also want to talk about uh, relationships. Your relationship with your child with ADHD, but also educators and also peers. Uh, so our relationship with people actually also can have a really profound effect on that constellation of factors called motivation. I'm going to talk a little bit about functional behavior assessment, and then we'll just close with procedures for using reward or motivation uh, systems. So let's start off with the, the big question, what is motivation? Um, so um, uh, I got this from a, a, a famous place, Psychology Today, but I liked it. So uh, one frame is that motivation is the desire to act in the service of a goal. Um, it's a crucial element in setting and attaining our objective. So that, that really kind of refers to like, what do you want to get done during the day? Do you want to get good grades in school? Do you want to be a better athlete? Um, do you want to have friends? Uh, do you, you know, more basic, do you need to get your homework done? Does your mom and dad or your parents need you to uh, clean up your room? Uh, do you want to get access to that video game that you really, uh, really kind of like? And so um, motivation is a really broad uh, a term, not really specific. The absence of motivation can lead to mental illnesses such as depression. And, and I'm sure most of you, if not all of you, are aware uh, ADHD is never considered to come by itself. There's typically always another a co-occurring condition and depression is uh, one of those. I also want to say though that I think it's inaccurate to say that any living thing is not motivated. So if your child is breathing, uh, they're motivated. They may just not be motivated by what you think is appropriate or uh, useful uh, to them. So that that's important from the get-go here is to separate what we'd like our child to be or to how they, to be functioning at the moment and where they're actually functioning now because of the constellation of their learning history, their disabilities, their relationships with people, um, many, many uh, factors. And so what also gets implied, I think, is what we're going to talk about next, which is this, uh, what I call a false dichotomy of extrinsic versus intrinsic motivation. So. And the reason I'm going to call it a false dichotomy is conceptually they appear to be separate from each other. But if you understand how um, human behavior or really the behavior of any organism is, is affected, if we get an extrinsic reward like a piece of food or a good behavior ticket, it's always also paired with uh, internal cognitive processing of that, uh, the, the feeling of, of the relationship with the person who delivers it. The concepts can be separated sort of like on and off, intrinsic, extrinsic, but functionally it's all kind of tied up in, in lots of different things. I also think that intrinsic motivation certainly is, is a, a higher value, right? You'd like people to do things you may also be aware of, of uh, uh, Maslow's hierarchy, where it basically starts as a, a need, physiological need. So uh, water, air, sleep, shelter, warmth, um, access to sex. And think also about, about deprivation. So if you're deprived of water or air, in that moment, the value of getting access to that is, is the most important. And, and other sources of, of uh, motivation will pale uh, be, because it's basically related to survival and we're going to call it later a primary reinforcer. 
also, if you don't feel safe, it's going to be hard for you to pay attention to higher order goals like academic achievement or um, ultimate happiness or, or whatever those uh, goals are. So a lot of your children um, probably experiencing bullying and harassment in schools because of their difference. And so that can cause a feeling of, of not being uh, safe, right? The next level are social needs, esteem needs. Um, and this becomes some of the higher order social functioning that we'd really like to see and then in the end, the, the idea is that you would self-actualize, that you would be internally motivated, that you would pursue goals and uh, have a meaningful life. I'm a, I'm a big believer in this. And in recent years, this next slide is meant to have some humor in it. Uh, the sources of motivation have been changed. And I know that many of you are concerned about your children's device use. And maybe you're using programs that limit the amount of screen time, that sort of thing. But there's a whole new set of literature out there that's really still being developed, documenting the really toxic impact um, of devices. Recognize also that on that screen on, on the child's phone, every time the screen changes, the brain gives them a little bit of serotonin and there's a reward to it. So if you watch a lot of programs aimed at young people in particular, the scenes change really fast. And that's a way of holding attention uh, through that rapid change, but it's also a source of uh, reward. So let's make a shift to reinforcement. And we often use that language of reward or reinforcer uh, interchangeably, but reinforcement is determined by the individual's behavior not by what we think it should be. So, so I hear teachers say, for example, I, I gave him a good behavior ticket and he gave it back to me, right? What's wrong with that kid? Well, what the, the child is telling you that for them, that's not sufficiently motivating in this moment, right? Um, you may hope that your child is highly motivated to do chores and have a clean house and they may have a different opinion in order for for a, a reward to have reinforcement properties so first of all it's a consequence but you need to see an increase in the future probability of that response so you can't infer reinforcement or motivation by observing a single event or a single interaction you have to look at the person over time none of this is going to happen quickly you're going to need thousands and thousands of opportunities to really observe and understand what motivates your, your child or student and how you can move their motivation in a direction that seems to be of, of value for the individual as well as for your family or whatever the social unit is. So reward works best if it's close to the behavior so that the child knows, you know, if you say good job or thank you for doing that, uh, the, it, the quicker it comes initially, the more likely they are to connect that feedback to the behavior. When we're learning something new, we want the schedule of reward to be pretty close to continuous, but because we don't want people to depend on that, we also, there's a method called fading, uh, which is to, uh, you, you know, not, not reward every behavior. And, and the theory is, and the reality is to some extent, initially we, we got a lot of feedback and then something about the task itself took on again you might call it an intrinsic value it has its own reinforcing uh, value there are also different types uh, edibles and there's controversy about giving students edibles but i like food so tangibles such as tokens uh, toys possessions uh, verbal things like praise um, uh, uh, physical or, or sensory uh, stimulation you, you may be more a uh, commonly referred, uh, uh, observed in students like with autism or other developmental disabilities, self-stimulation, finger flipping, uh, repetitive verbalizations, but some people even hit their head, uh, you know, play with their hair, that sort of thing. Uh, um, and another source of reward that, that I'm going to talk about a bit later too is access to a, a fun activity. So maybe you do this now if you're restricting access to devices until say your your child or student um, gets their homework done then the access to the device um, 
is is the reward. And then a final one on this slide is um, remember it's an it's a I guess an idiom. Uh, variety is the spice of life. So to try to deliver different things at different times. It makes for a richer life. Um, but you know the, the longer it's been since you've had uh, your favorite treat, the more valuable it is in the moment. I learned today that. Today is National Pizza Day, so my my oldest daughter and her family invited us to have pizza. So, by by uh, after dinner in in Oregon, where I live, um, I will have had pizza, and the value of having more pizza the next day uh, will be a bit, little bit less. So that variation is actually really a, a key thing. So, so there are two two basic types of reinforcers. Uh, one of those primary ones again: uh, sleep, water, uh, uh, food. Physical touch, actually, uh, I'm not suggesting that you systematically use that, but you, you might, you might uh, give your give your kid a hug that has reward uh, properties. And then the secondary, and they're always considered to have been at some point paired with the primary enforcer, and those are learned rewards such as praise or points, uh, work completion, uh, that sort of thing. So, so obviously. Most of the time, we want people to respond to uh, those secondary reinforcers and not be too dependent on, on the primaries. But in daily life, a mix of all that is, I think, is is uh, pretty good. Social attention is certainly reinforcing for some middle and high school age students. Um, uh, attention from their peers could be the most valuable thing, and that can actually interfere with their success in school and, and maybe even do harm if they're encouraged to do um, uh, unhealthy activities. Uh, verbal praise, verbal recognition, and then access to activities. So this is not meant to be a, a, a comprehensive list yet, but we're, there's a reason, there's a method to my uh, uh, madness here just a bit um, in that regard. So, so why use reinforcement? You're going to use reinforcement to teach new uh, replacement uh, behaviors to um, uh, make sure that there's a behavior that you'd like your child or student to do more that that you want to use re reward to get it get it going. And it also has this nice side benefit if it's delivered with sincerity uh, and contingently. It can it can actually strengthen the relationship between you. And your child or student. So, so success, mutual success, is a relationship strengthening. If your child has um, any kind of habitual and desirable behavior, maybe it's work avoidance, uh, talking back, um, non-compliance uh, type of thing. The the logic of the f is to find a behavior to replace that behavior, so they can still get their needs met, but do it in a more a benign and acceptable uh, way. So reward is actually very dynamic. So you got to think on your feet. I have to think about basketball. You know, basketball teams don't play the, don't do the same play every time or they would lose the game, but they do some things with intention. Um, sometimes you reward things accidentally, right? You, you don't you don't want your child to know that you glanced over at them when they did something inappropriate, but they kind of like that uh, uh, type of thing. Recognize too that we don't control all sources of reward, especially as children get older. And those sources of reward compete and the balance shifts with the influence of what we call setting events. So fatigue, uh, being tired, feeling depressed, feeling hungry, feeling thirsty, thoughts of anger or, or fear all interfere with how and what we attend to not only what we're supposed to do, known as antecedent as stimuli, but also um, the rewards that may be available. So, so you got to think on your feet. Maybe you said this yourself. A lot of people say it. This is uh, derived from a colleague of ours, Carolyn Webster Stratton. Shouldn't kids at this age just know it's expected? Do I have to reward them? Um, gosh, you know, uh, I'm 65 years old. I still get some rewards, but but I, I understand that sentiment. You'd like to them to just do it, but that's a value, right? For some of us, it feels unnatural. Uh, we're confused about coercion or bribing. Kids will come to depend on tangibles, and again, that depends on on how you you set things up, um, type of thing. Awards should only be for special achievements. 
nice idea, but a lot of kids who experience uh, frequent failure probably want to lower the bar uh, enough for them to feel success. We often use something called the 80-20 rule, where a student, if possible, your student or child should be successful 80% of the time. Not always possible to achieve, uh, but that's key. In schools, they're concerned about you know, having money to give a bunch of tangibles uh, type of thing. And a lot of people think by the time you're in middle or high school, uh, you don't need it. We value extrinsic, I mean, intrinsic motivation, but developmentally, that internal control is preceded by years of, of external control. Read effective parenting from whoever the caregiver is. Through those early years, you may never see a, a lot of internal or intrinsic motivation just because they're not developmentally uh, set to do that, right? And, and students at risk, including students with the ADHD, tend to favor short-term low-value rewards versus longer-term high-value rewards. We might appear to be more intrinsically motivated if we're doing something interesting or if I'm working in collaboration with or under the direction of someone that I care about. So so a, a big item, my teacher likes me, um, my, my parents love me and care for me. The value of, of your interaction around reward will also be uh, more valuable. And kids will come to depend on stuff if it's too predictable, right? That, that, that if, if they expect that every time they do some small thing, it's going to pay off, you got to have a conversation with them. Extrinsic rewards can be valuable when a child is learning something new because you want to praise and acknowledge um, trying or risk-taking uh, type of thing. And a, a lot of young people will fail, if you will, because they, they, they have that fear of, uh, of failure. And then also fluency building. So I, I think about everyone in my house are musicians. Um, and you got to do your scales and you got to play your chords. I'm a guitar player. And so Practice is sometimes boring, and so maybe you can up the motivation to do that type of activity uh, with some kind of extrinsic uh, reward. Um, each child is going to be different, but that's important. So, so that the so-called undermining effect of, of extrinsic reward doesn't occur if you're clear about what the standard of performance is and the child is challenged by it. So you're not wanting to reward the easy stuff, but find a nice balance between uh, what is what is um, challenging but achievable and, and uh, uh, recognize, as we know from Carol Dweck in Stanford, recognize effort and persistence uh, and, and maybe avoid um, recognizing that you're smart or you're gifted or something like that. So, so praise students for those malleable characteristics like sticking with it, getting things done, uh, uh, cooperating, and, and they'll, they'll be much more likely uh, to go with that. So students need to know uh, what, what it is. So research has shown that if we think an individual has complete control over his actions, it can potentially invoke anger in us, and it increases the likelihood that we'll use punishment. So if I believe my child or my student could, could do better, could work harder, could work for less rewards, and we think they've got control over it, we're probably just going to get mad at them is basically what that says. So if, on the other hand, we think that the individual may not have as much control over his actions, such as their response to motivation, right, we're much more likely to reach out and help in some way. So this slide really suggests that we um, give the child uh, the benefit of the doubt and try to understand why things are working from their point of view and not our point of view. Now, many of us don't like that, but, but you're going to win in the end if you try to meet the child uh, where uh, they are. We also know adolescents, uh, because of serotonin and the sex hormones, um, it's actually considered developmentally normal to um, have bouts of aggression or, or depression uh, type of thing. Just as a function of going through puberty, and now add in a little bit of anxiety, maybe associated with um, ADHD. And, and I can tell you, a depressed person is not going to have the same motivational set um, as, a, as a, a, tip, a person in a, in a typical 
psychological state. So if your child is being treated for depression, I really strongly encourage you to discuss uh, motivation concerns also with your healthcare uh, professionals because they may also be, uh, particularly certain uh, depression drugs in particular, have an effect on motivation. And it's actually shown in this graphic, the, the, this is the reward center, the yellow uh, part, and this is a young adult past that, that sort of puberty stage, and, and they're given an equivalent reward, if you will, and you can see that the adolescent uh, brain barely, barely lights up in, in that regards. It's not just a matter of values. There's actually some real science about how this affects us inside of our brain. And a lot of the early work on re reward, um, we didn't have this knowledge about, about what reward looks like in the brain. But that's the, the yellow there, that's a picture of, of reward and the, and the orangish looking color is a picture of uh, not so much. Behavior is learned and behaviors that work for a student will be maintained um, and behaviors that don't work uh, will uh, disappear. And that it makes us uncomfortable sometimes. Uh, learning depends on modeling and reinforcement. So that's why our students need to be really surrounded by positive uh, role models and people that they're attracted to, not physically or sexually attracted, but that they uh, care for them. So again, your motivation is gonna be more valuable if you uh, uh, are a person that the student uh, likes. So, so social bonding, some people call it the emotional bank account. Uh, your child or student should have something to lose when engaging in unacceptable behavior. And I'm not talking about threats, I'm just saying your approval and recognition is a, is a factor uh, there. Another one, your kids form peer groups, you hope they might Join a peer group based on ability or involvement in extracurriculars, but some children really uh, dive into really harmful patterns of behavior because they're looking to be accepted by their peers and they can reframe the goal of schooling and motivation and reinforce each other for achieving low expectations. So skipping school, not completing homework, using drugs and alcohol, um, being using bullying behavior, those can all be taught, encouraged, and rewarded by, by a peer group. So uh, you want to make sure that, that you have, have a good sense of community in your family and at school. Uh, make sure that you do bonding activities. Adolescents can be challenging, so make sure that, that um, you spend at least some time every day having positive, uh, caring interactions with your student. Look at the extent to which the child is attached to the social environment in the schools. A functional behavior assessment can allow you to describe the behaviors you want and don't want, what sets them off, and what's maintaining the problem behavior. So if your child is more motivated to play video games on their phone than do their homework, functional behavior assessment is designed to um, help unpack that and design a support plan that will uh, shift their motivation and attention um, around. <clears throat> it's strongly proven. To, to make a difference, not just with, with young people with ADHD, but, but a whole range of, of people with disabilities and those with, with the more typical development as well uh, um, in that regard. Most of the time, maybe you've participated in, you're gonna do an interview with a, with a person, but you can also interview yourself with some simple questions. At school, uh, the ch your child may be observed uh, by someone to document what their what their pattern is. There's a lot of material in the experimental literature, but we actually recommend that you you don't do that at home. Don't don't do experiments at home. So talk to people and and do some observation, and and that should be enough to help you be practical. So being thinking functionally about um, behavior should be ongoing. Uh, often in schools, it's regarded as a one-time fill out the form. Kind of thing, but we know that, that children are not stable, FBA results are not stable, and if you're going to use that functional assessment logic, it should be conducted for a single routine or time of the day, such as dinner time at home, math class at school, and not try to capture what's going on with the young person um, all day long. Um, you want to 
have a menu of reinforcers available um, in, in this regard. And you can ask your child. Uh, you can watch them. What, you know, what are they going for uh, in, in that regard? And so one method is called reinforcer sampling. Um, uh, takes a bit more skill to do something called forced choice, although as parents, we've probably all done it. You can have A or you can have B. I'll let you decide uh, type of thing. But one method is to do a reinforcer survey. And I encourage you to Google reinforcer survey because you'll get uh, a whole bunch of them that are quite good just right on the internet. I put one in the slideshow here and I'd be happy to share with you some of my other favorite ones if you want to want to contact me. So one method to assess motivation in your child is, is to uh, have them give you a list of, of what they'll work for. And most kids will not um, not ask for the moon or a million bucks. Uh, they'll uh, they'll uh, uh, really ask for, for uh, reasonable things. And I know and a lot of kids will tell me, I just want you to, to help me be successful, right? So so that that is a reward, that mentorship uh, relationship. So a couple of simple procedures. Um, so uh, a common one is is called the PREMAC principle. It's named after a fellow named PREMAC. You make a high probability behavior, in other words, something that I really like to do, contingent on the performance of a low probability uh, behavior. So you got to do your homework before you play on your device, right? You got to clean up your room before you have a snack. Um, and, and eat popcorn and watch TV or something like that. So it's essentially that if then argument. And you may say, oh, I tried that, it didn't work. Um, but you gotta, you, you gotta be uh, clear about, about it, it's, a, it's a procedure, it's gotta be tight uh, to do it. And, and even if mistakes are made, uh, you can do it. So a couple example, uh, Ms. Token, that's supposed to be funny. When they complete their history worksheet, they can use computers in the classroom, search the web for information on current events. When students in Mr. Times science class finish their project, they may talk quietly at their tables. Again, you can come up with your home example uh, as well. But PREMAC is, is pretty, pretty important in that regard. So just a reminder, uh, if you're going to use rewards, um, make sure you, the child knows that they're getting rewarded for what what they just did uh, initially uh, type of thing. And you can also just tell a student, I'm doing this for you or with you because you met a preset standard. You wouldn't use that language of the kid, but you get, get where I'm going uh, with that. <clears throat> the concern about overuse of uh, extrinsic so-called is, is certainly valid. And so if you're using tangibles, try to fade to social. You're always going to pair a social comment with the delivery of, of a tangible. Maybe you value least artificial to most natural. I'd like you to just do it because it's a cool, cool thing. So that's called fading, if you will. Um, you can move from adult managed to self managed. Pretty frequent in the beginning to less frequent uh, type of thing. Predictable to unpredictable. Uh, in, in that regard. So, so um, you want to build towards intrinsic motivation by making sure that students instruction is, is matched to their abilities, uh, that you acknowledge both academic and social success. Teachers really like kids that get along with, um, with other kids in their class. And then the final thing I'm going to hit on is, is uh, a technology of self-management. And this ties back to one of the things in the session description about is your child able to set and achieve goals that will make them successful in life. So, so that's also about five webinars. So just going to give you a, a starter on it. So, so I'm a major fan. I'm a major user. Uh, Self-management, identify problem behaviors and replacement behaviors. So I don't get my work done. That's the problem. The replacement is I do my homework. I, uh, I do my exercise, whatever that is. And then I, I do a, a, a set of skills. I self-monitor, self-record, self-evaluate. I may even self-instruct and ultimately self-deliver uh, reinforcement. A key thing we like about self-management, as we're going to see too, is a lot of the initial techniques involve using visual aids, such as checklists or point cards. And if for students with ADHD or children with ADHD, 
it's often useful for that that permanent icon to, to be present for them as opposed to a lot of verbal language like I'm giving you uh, now but but that the the instruction or the standard is is uh, it's, it's a easier to, to process if it stays there and I can look at it so so that's a key thing so you said teach it because it's practical it's it's a good a curriculum adaptation it's a way to make thinking overt because you, you the students going to tell you what they're supposed to do it's a way to ultimately replace adult mediated behavior it can be a, the, one of the sources of conflict and it can promote independence and positive behavior now and and in the future and again uh, multiple books uh, on self-management uh, and, and uh, I know Chad has resources and you're also welcome to contact me uh, in, in that regard. Um, so a little humor to get us close to the end, uh, sleep late, eat junk food, read tabloids, veg out, nothing gets done if you don't write it down. That's certainly true uh, in my life um, and I use a number of apps on my um, uh, phone and tablet and, and computer to keep track of my uh, daily task list, not just for work, but also personal goals such as exercise, uh, time with my family, uh, uh, my spiritual life, my community service, et cetera, et cetera. So, so self-monitoring refers to being aware, are you doing what you're supposed to be doing? Uh, uh, Self-recording means to, to mark it that you did it in some way. And then self-evaluation, which is harder, is to say, did I, did I meet the criteria? Did I do it well? or in an acceptable kind of way. And then ultimately I should be able to say, um, good good job uh, to myself. So, so this is just a set of implementation uh, steps. Um, many of you, if you have children in school, may be aware of a pretty popular uh, technique called check in, check out. Uh, again, you may like it, you may not like it, but that actually uses um, <clears throat> the elements of, of uh, self-management. Um, this is a, a, a pretty complex uh, sample of, uh, of a self-monitoring chart. Um, in this instant, the, the child is actually going to rate themselves first and then be given feedback uh, uh, by the teacher. So raise your hand before you ask to get out of seat. Keep your hands and feet to yourself. Uh, follow teacher directions. Uh, that's one example. And I'll fix that before I send it out to you because it should all fit on one page. Uh, maybe you've experienced something called a school home note. A huge amount of uh, research and support of uh, homeschool communication um, in in this form. So you could actually review your child's uh, success or not at school. Uh, this is a more classic uh, check and check out point card uh, where the child again um, is noting a, a score from no good to excellent in the scale on the chart each period and then the teacher initials um, whether they agree or not it's imperative that the teacher be kind in correcting inaccuracies of a perception but there, there's some good support uh, for this uh, work uh, i tossed in a few uh, from a great research source called pinterest um, uh, tracking trash to get you um, done right look at your chart um, uh, did you take it out? What would you know you do to create less trash? But you might also associate a reward uh, with it. And then this is just terribly cute uh, to, uh, to uh, give give a child a, a visual representation of their day and some feedback about about their performance. So just want to close so we have time for questions. Um, you want to you want to use motivation uh, systematically reinforcement. Uh, um, so it, it's more that you, you want to be praising what you want your students to, to do uh, uh, more and more effectively than, than the things they do that you don't want them to do. And, and children have a lot of those, a lot of those things, right? Uh, make sure you're matching the reinforcement to the function of the target behavior. So if you're not aware of the functional behavior assessment technology, I really recommend you do some learning about that, uh, both from Chad and also our organization, PBIS.org, the National Center. We have quite a few um, parenting resources, which are not specific to students with ADHD. One of the things I really admire about Chad is the, the 
immense amount of excellent uh, uh, research supported information that's available right through the organization. So I definitely encourage you to, to start there first. Um, certainly consider child development <coughs> when, and, and mental health concerns. When using rewards and setting expectations for success, and then my, my last small bit of humor is lather, rinse, repeat. It's, it's a dynamic, ongoing process to help your child um, be more motivated towards the things that will make them be successful um, in life. My child is smart but procrastinates, which results in scrambling at the last minute to complete work. Um, it's an unpleasant situation for him. You'd think there's no reward to continue the behavior, but oh, okay. uh, that doesn't change. Any thoughts on how to break the cycle? He's 15. Yeah, part of it, you know, that it's, it's, it's that classic, if it weren't for the last minute, nothing would get done, right? So um, it you might think about like a, a, a I'm going to call it a curriculum adaptation. So if the child's doing their homework, I may, and again, maybe you've already done this, but um, help them chunk it into smaller pieces. And, and maybe you could work with their teacher too, so that if they're looking at, at 20 problems, um, you know, break it into five. Let's get five done. Good. Now let's get five more done. Um, however, you can do that. And you, you may um, have facility uh, with that. Um, or not um, type of thing. You could also consider um, if the reward is associated with the work completion, it's something I mentioned a little earlier, maybe consider adding in some, some feedback during the working time, uh, again, praising effort or sticking with it uh, type of thing so that the child, at least initially, is getting getting that feedback um, um, uh, you know while they're doing the work because because what what I'm hearing is they're they're procrastinating means they're they're probably spacing out or or maybe they're anxious and they're they're wanting to touch their phone or or, or whatever they're doing and, and I think we all do it right but but um, uh, that's the first thing that comes to mind is just if you can't break it into smaller, uh, bits so that that um, the child doesn't doesn't have that sort of last minute um, anxiety, and, and and if you haven't, uh, please talk with the child's teacher because they, as curriculum experts, they should be able to help you break things into bits. So that's my best shot for now. So the next question is: um, Is there a typical age based on the literature where the reward system of tokens dissipates? Yeah, that's a great that's a great question. Um, I think I, I I don't see it. Um, so the the token itself um, is is uh, it's like money. So so money is a token. Paycheck is a token uh, because the token buys what's called the backup reinforcer or reward, if that makes sense. And so if your child is rejecting um, the token right what, what they're telling you is whatever they're getting the backup for isn't sufficient uh, any longer what what may also occur i know in schools a lot um they they may pass out a lot of good behavior tickets but um then they'll use a lottery reward system and some children learn right away that they're never going to get anything uh, for those tokens so they've essentially been unconsciously taught that the token itself has no no value so in in the language of con contingency that the behavioral language that that I use the the token is only going to be effective um, to the extent that it gets the student something of high value and and part of it is that at age uh, you're right um, what of, is of high value may no longer be affordable if that makes sense, but that's also why I introduced like the the premac principle. So you, the the token reward backup might be access to an activity, right? Like time with my friends or time on my screen or whatever is acceptable or whatever you've negotiated uh, uh, with your child uh, or your student. But um, uh, 
you might not necessarily ever grow out of tokens. I, uh, but I think it, 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 it does get to that point where people, you know, you should just do it because it's the right thing. And I'm not saying that about the person asking in any way, but, but it always needs to be, the value will always be determined relative to, to what that token uh, buys or backs up. Um, you've discussed reinforcements in terms of positives. What are the times when negative reinforcement should be used, if ever? Yeah, that's, a, that's also a great question. So technically, negative reinforcement um, is, it, I, I think that the questioner is, is making that synonymous with, uh, with a, a punishment. So negative reinforcement means you escape something unpleasant. So for example, if I, in our first question, I procrastinate, I don't get my homework done. If nothing happens, I've been rewarded for procrastination by escaping, okay? Now, there are different guidelines uh, uh, for these uh, punishment methods or uh, averses. So the first guideline is it should always be done as a fair pair. So for whatever behavior you want to make unpleasant, uh, or aversive for a student, you should always identify a replacement behavior that re that they get some form of positive uh, uh, feedback about. Um, the other, th there's a whole set also of um, ethical guidelines, and one of them is the fair pair, right? Don't don't ever just punish a student uh, because you're essentially telling them stop, but you're not saying stop and do this uh, uh, type of thing. Two other ones, and this is short, and I'd be happy to, to send. There's a field. It's called behavioral ethics, um, actually, that that um, that uh, severe uh, punishment, such as seclusion or restraint, uh, uh, should never be used without uh, quite a lot of documentation and and uh, control. Also, if you're using a a corrective consequence or an aversive consequence, if it doesn't work fairly quickly, uh, ratcheting up the value or the or the negativity of the consequence uh, probably isn't going to work. And so you want to have a balance there again of of uh, of uh, um, not not making it worse and worse and worse uh, in the hope that the student will ultimately uh, comply. So. Just to close on that, you want to balance a positive and negative. It's probably impossible to have an interaction with anyone without at least part of it being aversive or negative. So typical parenting stuff, removing privileges, spending a little bit of time in your room, uh, 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 you know, loss of, of uh, you know, an object, any of that thing is all, all, all appropriate, particularly if it's balanced with, um, access to some sort of riches of, of social recognition, um, uh, that sort of thing. And if, if a child fails to meet the criteria, then, then they, don't, they don't get the reward, right? That's, that's also would be considered a, a form of punishment. But like reinforcement, you can only infer punishment by watching the student behave over a long period of time. So yelling at a student once or taking away a privilege once all you can say is that was the event, it was unpleasant, but you only know if it worked if the child does it less. In the case of punishment, uh, in, in future opportunities, or in the case of reinforcement, if they do what you want more. So, so um, uh, that's, that's about the best I can do in, in a short one today. So, A couple of questions, uh, similar questions from, uh, from our attendees, and that is that um, they have experienced um, that the positive reinforcement just doesn't seem to work. Um, is there any, you know, anything that they can do um, that they may not be doing um, that will help them get those rewards to work? Yeah, yeah. So that's that's what I think. It's so complex. I wish I wish life were were simpler. Right. That. The, the, the one suggestion I had was around a, a, a reinforcer menu. So, so you, you actually get a sense from your child about, about um, uh, what, what they will 
uh, work for if you're establishing rewards, particularly as children get older. Um, uh, I recommend that you do it as, as, a, as a, a discussion and negotiation so that the child has some investment in, in uh, what they're uh, working for. Um, it could also be failing, if you will, um, because it's not being delivered often enough. Um, uh, again, that, that recognition that, that early on, and if you're a parent, you're probably going to have to reward your kid more than you'd like to, right? So, so I'm a I'm a parent. I'm a I'm a father and, and a, of two daughters, and so yeah, I just wanted him to do it because because I'm the dad, right? So that or we're the we're the mom and dad. We have a a, a, a traditional family in that regard. Um, but sometimes you gotta you gotta up the ante a bit just to get it going, and that's where that method of fading uh, uh, can also can also come in. But the other thing is, if if you're trying a particular strategy, and it's not working, it's not an issue of reward or reinforcement. It's, it's just an issue with that particular strategy. So, so that's why in that functional behavior assessment logic, um, I'd recommend. And this is also true. I still do it, and I'm supposed to know what I'm doing here. If I get stuck, I want to do some brainstorming or problem solving with another individual who may see it. From a different perspective, or um, or uh, notice a pattern that I'm engaging in that I'm not even aware of. So that may be uh, many of you probably have children with a with an ADHD coach or a, a counselor or a teacher. Uh, also, if your student is a customer at school, you just do the 504 or the IEP process. Um, <laughs> you know, ask for help. Ask for help. And problem solving, all those nuances because it's it really is complicated. And uh, the the idea is simple: reward versus punishment. Do this more, do this less. But in application, it's it's much much more complicated, particularly with with children with more challenging needs. Um, so it looks like we've covered most of the questions, um, Dr. Sprague. Um, is there anything else you wanted to um, cover before we wrap up? Uh, no, I think we're good. I, I uh, like I said, if uh, at the University of Oregon we teach um, approximately uh, uh, sixty hours of coursework um, for graduate students just on this topic. So if uh, if it's mysterious and challenging, you're you're not alone in that regard. So um, and I think about one of the most famous guitar players in the world is a man named Andre Segovia, and he said that. The guitar is the uh, easiest instrument to play, but one of the most challenging to play well. And so as you approach uh, motivation, I think it's it's easy to get started and, and um, it, you know, get get some help with the problem solving because it, it never ends. So that, that's great. <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you for providing us with great information and tips. And thanks to everybody here for joining us. We appreciate you being here.